Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I am one of your hosts, Jimmy Wong. And I'm Jordan Pridgen. Your other host today, uh, Jordan, is one of our fellow 40K lovers here in the office, office uh, and we are doing the budget upgrade guides. Today, it's the Forces of the Imperium deck, really spicy Esper deck, black, white, and blue. There's a lot going on here, but first, we got to talk about our sponsors. That's right. Head on over to cardkingdom.com slash command or cardkingdom.com slash command zone and pick up the magic product you need so that you can battle it out in any universe you want. It could be a universe right here at home or a universe beyond. It could be a plane that you love or an actual airplane like the Skyship Weatherlight. Whatever you want, those cards are there for you at cardkingdom.com slash command. That's an affiliate link. That's all you have to do is go into your browser and enter that and shop away. Get the magic cards you need for your deck. And Card Kingdom, they've got great customer service, really fast shipping, and they're going to get you the cards you need so that you can compete and have fun on the battlefield. More fun than before because you got more tools to do so. So just make sure you go to cardkingdom.com slash command. We're so very happy to be back with Card Kingdom. And of course, once you get those cards keep them nice and safe and protected in an ultra pro sleeve josh myself and plenty of people here at the office have been trusting ultra pro product for a long long time to keep their cards in pristine condition and now you can shop directly from their site with another affiliate link it's pretty simple ultrapro.com slash command and once you're there you can buy a ton of great stuff often at great discounts they just had like a 50 percent off sale moments ago i get the uh, notifications in my inbox and i always check through because there's something i need a binder uh, even a binder page some sleeves a playmat with awesome art that's just super on sale you can find it there or just buy some ultra pro ultra pro product from your uh, lgs when you're over there or just go to ultrapro.com slash command that is our affiliate link finally last way to support the show directly at patreon.com slash command zone we've got the zone at the end of that one we shout out one lucky patron every single week and this week's episode is dedicated to jasmine, jasmine farmer. farmer jasmine you rock. rock. You do rock indeed. And don't forget, on Patreon, we've been playing games of spell table with our patrons at select tiers. So make sure you check it out. Uh, there's lots going on there, too. Yeah, those have been pretty fun. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, okay. Forces of the Imperium, the pre-con budget upgrade guide. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, indeed. <laughs> um, so, you know, I thought we would take just a short second here for all of the non-40K players out there that don't know anything about the lore, and even those that do, we just want a little brush up. Jordan, can you give us just a quick breakdown of who the Imperium are? I can. And, and for those of you who know 40K lore, this is going to be... Uh, Very abbreviated. Truncated to the point of sometimes being Offensive. incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I will get comments about it, but boy, I'm trying. It's okay. Disclaimer <laughs> has been made. Most most of us have no idea, including myself, so fill us in. So, the Imperium, also known as the Empire or the Imperium of, Ma of, the Imperium of Man, mm. was founded by, like, an immortal psychic Superman who is now known as the Emperor. Got it. Imperium and was founded by Superman. Basically, from the ruins of, like, an ancient human civilization that was, uh -huh. like, a long time ago. He, it's pretty close to Superman. He... <laughs> That's true, actually. <laughs> Krypton. Yeah. yeah. It's oh, very, Krypton. very close. Okay, all right. Keep going. Uh, the world used to have this enormous empire that mm -hmm. was ruined in what is now known as the Dark Age of Technology and ah. was once known as the Golden Age of Technology. A tale as old as time when it comes to sci-fi. Exactly. Uh, but then 10,000 years ago, the year, by the way, is 40K-ish uh -huh. uh, in the world. That's why it's called 40K. But in the year 30K, uh, the Emperor united Terra and basically tried to reconquer the galaxy, uh, launching a crusade and using his superhuman space marines as like the forces that would take everything out out there. Gotcha, okay. And then so, at the height of that expansion, when he had like conquered a lot of the galaxy, half of the Space Marine Legions betrayed him and started something called the Horus Heresy and basically just created a huge civil war. <laughs> the Emperor won, sort of, but he was injured so badly that they had to hook him up to a piece of life support called the Golden Throne. Ooh, and he's like- Life gain. Yeah, he's basically a corpse sitting there and has been there for about 10,000 years. Yikes. So without his like direct guidance, basically the Imperium has started worshiping him as a god ah. and following into and falling into these like extreme religious xenophobic authoritarian ways. So right. like the Inquisition and things like that are really the power I in see. 
uh, but Empire. the Emperor is just like uh, doesn't say anything but they're just now exactly. straight up crazy worshipping him he, he's still a really really powerful psychic so he's like important to the Empire I but see. he never really gets to say anything to anybody or lead in any particular way yeah. they just sort of half remember what his mission was he's kind of like Aloro in the command zone yes okay. he right. never has to enter the battlefield right okay well that is the Imperium they have kind of forgotten why they went on this great plan a millennia earlier but, now they're uh, just like trying to stay alive yeah and there's a lot of different sp factions and types of space marines too that got split because of that civil war and stuff too right yeah there, there's really cool. a ton of different space mar space marine chapters and legions they used to be legions now they're chapters like way more divided up gotcha. and stuff well let's take a look then at two of the main characters from both 40k as well as the lead singers of this deck the first Boy. one i will read is inquisitor grayfax this is the commander that's on the front of the box uh the inquisitor is pretty cool characters you guys can read more about them later don't let me spend another 10 minutes talking about it it is his one blue a black and a uh, white for a 3-3 three, three legendary human inquisitor with vigilance and two abilities the first is called unquestionable wisdom other creatures you control get plus one plus zero and have vigilance and the second ability is called hunt for heresy where you can pay one mana and tap inquisitor grayfax to have tap target creature and opponent controls investigate so you make a clue token which is an artifact you can sacrifice for two to draw a card so uh interesting card it's an esper investigate slash tap down ability bit of an anthem going on to yep like... plus one plus zero for other creatures and then yeah that that tapping is kind of like removal but you're making a clue token it's like inquisitor is inquisiting it's it's nice sure you've got like word. some card draw on the commander and stuff yeah it's it's good but i think uh this next one's a bit more impressive so why don't you tell us about this character well the backup commander uh in the deck is marnius kalgar this is two white blue black for a three five legendary creature astartes warrior uh with double strike and the ability master tactician whenever one or more tokens enter the battlefield under your control draw a card oh and then he has chapter master which is six of any mana create two 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 white Astartes warrior creature tokens with vigilance. Okay, so that second ability, you pay six mana, you make two two twos, so four power, four toughness total and to over two creatures with tokens. They have vigilance, and then you draw a card. You draw a card. You only draw one card because if one or more tokens enter, you still just get one. Right but... now, if you were able to activate this ability twice, you would yep. draw two cards because every time a token enters, it sees. Okay, am I coming in with other friends? Great, we're all coming in at the same time, and then that's going to trigger Marnius, and then it would the second instance would happen if, if you couldn't get that going. And just to be entirely clear, it's not creature tokens. It's any kind of token that enters right. the battlefield. Right, very, very cool. Yeah, and we just saw with Inquisitor Grayfax, uh, she makes clue tokens. So that would also trigger Marnius Kalgar. Yep. Okay, so now that we have the two main commanders of the deck out of the way, let's take a look at the... Stats! <laughs> so, ramp spells, there are 11. Uh, a lot of actually really classic ramp cards in here for Esper, which is Artifacts. And then there's 12 sources of card draw. As far as single target removal goes, holy moly, 11. That's pretty nice. Yeah, it's really nice. Yep. And then five board wipe yeah. type effects. That is, that, that's probably more board wipes than I would run. And uh, we'll see how I react to that. <laughs> that's mm. true. When we do the 10 in and 10 out. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, we always talk about the stats that are sort of related to the deck. So there are 22 cards that care about or make tokens, as we both see in Quizzer Grey Effects and Marnius Calgar care about this. And then there's a new ability in this uh, precon called Squad. And do you want to read the rules text on that? Yeah. So squad is as an additional cost to cast the spell. You may pay two any number of times. When this creature enters the battlefield, create that many tokens that are copies of it. Cool. So basically two mana, you get another copy of that creature. It enters as a token instead. And, so, and to be clear, the the six squad cards are included in the 22 token cards right. mentioned before. Correct. Good point. Good mm -hmm. point. Um, and then, of course, it seems like there are creatures being made with Marnius and other cards. So there are... 11 cards that do some type of mass pump effect. Yep. And then five cards that care about attack triggers. And then for life gain, uh, seven cards there. And that's not necessarily a sub-theme of the deck, as we'll see with some of the cards. It's actually just cards that would be good as their own commanders. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the deck definitely has a couple things that are like not, that are for their own flavorful yeah. things and not all completely on theme yeah okay so the big question as always with these decks typically it's the it's you know the answer but we ask ourselves who should you run as the commander so again we have inquisitor grayfax who makes clue tokens and taps stuff down and gives your creatures plus one plus one vigilance and then marnius kalgar who draws a card anytime any kind of token enters the battlefield under your control and then can make tokens as well yeah 
And I think Marnius Calgar was the obvious choice. Yeah, yeah, by far, I think the obvious choice here. Really, really powerful ability. And I mean, if you can have all, if all these other ways to make tokens, just up the card, draw the deck enormously. So Yeah, there's, again, 22 sources of token stuff. Um, it Deck seems like it already synergizes a little better with Marnius than Inquisitor Greyfax necessarily. Uh-huh. Yeah, so tons of value there. And I think it's easier also to do the experiment where we're taking 10 cards out and putting 10 cards in. Yep. Um, so Inquisitor Greyfax, I would I expect if I wanted to build that deck, it would be much more into the, maybe even the, even the stasis side of things. Yeah. Just getting a little more lockdown, a little more control. And giving everything vigilance, you can get a lot of value out of creatures that do have like powerful tap abilities and still yeah, be able to point. attack with it. That's a good point. But I, I just don't think it's, it's as clean and obvious a, yeah. a strategy, especially it's, if you're trying to go from pre-con to like... Yeah, yeah, right. The whole point of this experiment is to be able to take this precon and sit down at the table and have a good time. Yep. Uh, and at least be able to, you know, put your fists up and duke it out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the next important thing we always talk about in these episodes is the reprint value uh, for all you collectors out there or people that are buying these because you want to get some sweet cards out of it. Everyone's always wondering, well, you know, 40K especially, these decks have all brand new are all themed to the Forces of the Imperium or whatever uh, sort of group it is that the deck is for. Um, and so we want to figure out what are the value of the reprints before the deck was announced so that because the moment that these things get announced, yeah. prices drop. Um, and there is a bit of a caveat, and we'll go into it here. But let's just start off with the total reprint value. There are only 38 reprints in this deck, which is really low, because typically you see you know, 60, 70 plus. Yeah, normally most of the cards are reprints. Yeah, not counting, of course, basic lands and all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the total reprint value was only $53.66. Which sounds kind of low, but... You know, as we are going to go into, I don't think is is entirely representative of, of yeah. much of the deck. So, Jordan, why don't you tell me a little bit and the audience why we can't just take this number at face value in the same way that we have done in the past for precons? Because there are just an enormous amount of new cards. I think one, the fact that we have you know thirty eight new cards, which could no thirty eight reprints. Oh, sorry, thirty eight reprints. That means on the other end of it, we're talking another thirty forty new cards. Yeah, it's yeah. almost forty new cards. I think it's like thirty nine in this one. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a bunch. That's that's going to create a lot of value, and especially since these are unique cards that have been printed for this. Yeah. Who knows, like how much they're all going to end up kind of being worth? But even if they don't create extra special value, it's still very novel because you know we don't see this many new cards typically yeah. with commander products there, especially because they've been releasing more. It's very dangerous as a design to just release new stuff into the wild. But the forty thousand Warhammer decks. These have been in playing for a long, long time. There's a lot of ground to cover, so we have a bunch of new cards. So what we did instead is we had our good friend here at the office, Truck, our, do... Our st- statistician guy. Statistician, yeah, all around all-star when it comes to math. So we have something that is actually called the interpolated deck price. And what that... Well, actually, actually, why don't you explain what does interpolated deck price mean? So the way it basically works is because we don't know how much these are going to be, we, we looked at the new reprints... Uh, of decks from the last couple years. Right. And kind of just averaged the value of new cards printed in commander sets. Yeah. And we said, if each of these cards, each of these new cards is about average, if they're not more expensive than usual, Mm -hmm. um, what what would the price of the deck be? Right. So this is a new deck price. It isn't just looking at reprints. It's looking at specifically the deck price if, you know... adjusting it knowing okay because of course uh-huh. if you, let's say you have 70 cards that are reprints and you only have uh, 20 new cards in each thing then those 70 cards you know we know the price of that you can find it average, but the new cards we don't really know because when the deck comes out there's a moment in time when people don't know what the cards are with sometimes things shoot up dramatically like a dockside extortionist mm-hmm. or there could just be a superstar card like black market connections that ends up being worth more and throwing it one way or the other So what we've done is taking the average of the new cards, because there are some that are worth very little as well, average that out and just assumed baseline without looking at the cards themselves, making any judgments. All right, we have the cards that we know are new and we have the reprints. We can calculate the reprint price, but we don't know the new cards. We're just going to take the average and just apply it and multiply it by how many new cards there are. And if all these new cards are exactly average, then the interpolated deck price, as we're calling it, is $96.63. Now, let's take a look at the new interpolated deck prices for a bunch of the other ones that we've seen in the past. So, Commander Ikoria adjusted as 110 and 796. We can go down the list here. Most recently, the Baldur's Gate pre-cons, the average reprint value was really high, $104, and adjusted 
for this interpolated price was 114. Yeah. So taking a look at all of this, the $96 that this deck is at is actually on the low end here. It is a little low, yeah. But it's really hard to tell. And keep in mind, we're not trying to be accurate necessarily. No. We're not trying to give you the exact number because it's impossible. But also because we're giving you these numbers so that you you can compare two decks of the past. That's not for you to be like, oh, this one's better than that one. It's like, no. It, we're just doing it so that you can have a frame of reference as a buyer and a collector and all that as well. And that's how we hope to provide a little bit of value for those uh, people in the audience, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. That's a lot of text to basically say that the price is a little low. Yeah. And I will add the caveat that we really don't know what these Warhammer decks. Absolutely. It's the f- first of its kind products in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So we'll see. And, and of course, I mean, if players if, are still figuring out how to play with these new cards, there could be something in here that's really strong and busted. Who knows? Exactly. Or, or if one of the like alternate art prints for a card yeah like becomes a really hot ticket item it could end up costing more and stuff it, it really just is very hard to say yeah that's why we like focusing on the reprints the cards that we know have been around and uh for what it's worth let's talk about them now yes notable reprints so these are cards that are worth more than two dollars and because there are again not that many reprints 38 total there are only two cards over five dollars or more and four cards that are between two and five dollars yikes okay but very interestingly, these these uh, first two are, they're getting up there. So let's talk about them. Oh, yeah. All right, Jordan, what is our first reprint here? The first reprint is Talisman of Progress. This is the uh, white and blue one in the Talisman cycle, uh, can, which, yep. yes. Uh, for two mana, you can, it creates an artifact, which you can tap to add colorless, or you can tap it and add white or blue, but Talisman of Progress deals one damage to you. Yeah, really good because unlike Signets, you can play these, let's say, turn one with a Soul Ring, and then you can actually tap it and then play something else, yep. like a Divining Top or some one-drop artifact, Wayfarer's Bobble, you name it. Really powerful, good in any white-blue deck. And this was at $14.75. I'm assuming just this card hasn't seen print in a while, and people are realizing the power of it as a two-mana artifact in Commander as well. Absolutely. Um, next up is a classic. We've talked about it probably 500 times on the show now. It's Skull Clamp. Hey! Uh, and this one has cool art, too. So it's a one-mana artifact. Gives a creature plus one, minus one. And then when the equipped creature dies, you draw two cards. So just throw it on the one-one token, and you're going to town. Yep. That um, create a lot of card advantage. Yeah, a lot of card advantage. And that was sitting at $10. So we've seen this card be reprinted a few times now, which just tells you how powerful it is. Really cheap to, p- to play, really easy to equip just one, and then you're drawing a bunch of cards if your deck set up. a ton of decks. Yep. All right, uh, let's talk about the reprints between $2 and $5, and to the surprise of no one, if Talisman of Progress was up there, well, what do we have here, Jordan? Up next is Talisman of Hierarchy. And right after that, it's... It's Talisman of Dominance. Yeah, these, so <laughs> both the other Talismans. <laughs> these are basically the same as the other Talisman, except Talisman of Hierarchy can tap for white or black and deal one damage to you. And then Talisman of Dominance can tap for blue or black and then deal one damage to you. Yep. So these were at $4.60, $4.35, respectively. And they're just really good cards. I do love, a short aside, I love the wording that they use because white and blue, the word Uh is progress, which makes sense. Knowledge, learning. Uh, Blue and black is dominance. So blue, black control, taking stealing creatures. And then white and black is hierarchy. And and the thing that, like, th- they couldn't have planned this because right. they didn't know the 40K things were happening when they designed those talismans. Oh, right. But they are on point for the Imperium. Oh, really? Yeah. It is just like... Yeah, they even have three separate flags of, I guess, three different things. Yep. Yeah. So they really took their time here with the art and stuff. Um, you should definitely check it out if you're a fan. And there's so much lore to dive into. That's good to oh, know. Oh, man. Yeah. The, just, just all the flavor text they've put on, like, all the cards in this deck... It's amazing. It's yeah. so much fun just looking through them. All right. The other two cards between $2 and $5 is Entrapment Maneuver, which it forces a player to sacrifice an attacking creature, and you make X-1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens where X is that creature's toughness. And then Launch the Fleet, it's a white sorcery they can strive, so it costs one more to cast for each target, and then you make any number of target creatures gained. When this attacks, you make a 1-1 one, one soldier creature token that's tapped and attacking. So just some solid token generators pretty good for marnius calgar i would say yep seems great draw some cards okay yeah so those are the main reprints um again there's a lots of cards that just sit between one dollar and two dollars but just to keep it abbreviated we do between two and five but uh the talismans very good cards you should play them okay before we jump here let's talk about the best cards in the deck 
Woo woo! Yeah, and this, there are a lot of cool cards in this deck. It was really hard to choose just like a couple best cards in the deck because there's there's a bunch that I think are very playable and are cool and unique. Yeah, but and actually, all four of the ones we chose today are from are brand new cards from the 40k universe world. Oh yeah, uh, the first one is Vexillus Praetor. Wait a minute, Praetor. Yeah, isn't that a magic thing? It's a different thing. Ah, okay, <laughs> all right, but similar. Uh, yeah, kind of. All right, cool. Good enough. Uh, so. This is three and a white for a three, four creature Custodes Warrior. So the Custodes are like the people who guard the emperor himself. Ooh, okay, well, high up. They're like the, the those cool guards with the big red masks in Star Wars, right? Exactly. They're like nice. very powerful. Like each person is kind of an army in his own uh, yeah. right. Yeah, they're not sequel powerful. They're just regular trilogy powerful. This card <laughs> has Flash, Vigilance, and then Aegis, Aegis of the Emperor. Commanders you control have protection from everything. Whoa, it gives them progenitus. <laughs> it's pretty good. So a four mana flash spell, and it has vigilance too on it. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, and it gives your commander protection from everything. Not just commander, commanders, so if you have a partner commanding pairing. Yep. Yeah, this is definitely one of the big standout cards. A lot of people have been talking about this. It seems like Wizards is making a lot of these sort of four mana impactful flash spells. I've seen a lot of spells recently that are four mana and all have flash. So this definitely seems like a pattern they're keeping up. I think that's sort of where they kind of want the average CMC to balance out towards for commander yeah. as well. That's what I'm feeling between three and four. It seems very cool, very powerful. It will make equipment and enchantments fall off though. Oh, interesting. I didn't even think about that. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay, so not that great in certain circumstances, but very good for a lot of other things. For decks where you just want to protect your commander, amazing. Yeah, uh, very good. Okay, uh, next up, one of the best cards in the deck is And They Shall Know No Fear. Oh, yeah. One in a white for an instant. Choose a creature type. Creatures you control of the chosen type get plus one, plus zero, and gain indestructible until end of turn. So we've seen how powerful indestructible is. We've seen it with so many cards. One in a green does it uh, with heroic intervention. Yeah. Uh, we've also seen the Chroma's Will is going to do a similar thing. So a lot of, uh, you know, in this case, it's tribal because it's choose a creature type. Yep. But this is a one in a white instant that does a very similar thing to heroic intervention. And we all know how good that card is. Yeah. I, I think that's just good all the time. Very good. Yeah. Um, uh, let's have you read this next one, actually. Up next is Space Marine Devastator. This is three and a white for a 3-3 three, three creature Astartes Warrior. Um, this has Squad 2, which we mentioned earlier, which means you can make a Obvious. large number of them just by paying two each time. And this has Grav Cannon. When Space Marine Devastator enters the battlefield, destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment. Okay, so... The reason I put this on the list is I was looking on Scryfall and I was looking up, all right, what creatures in white do this thing, which is the um, the green... Uh, the Reclamation Sage. Yeah, the Reclamation Sage. Type. We just talked about it. I forgot the name already. <laughs> yeah. Um, because this one's really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's four mana. So the other options as a creature that enters the battlefield and specifically, right, because white has Fragmentize and a bunch of other spells that just kill an artifact or an enchantment or, yeah. or wipes them. But for a creature and the battlefield ability... Uh, there's only a card called Rambunctious Mutt, which costs five mana. And then there's Core Sanctifiers, which is two mana, but you have to pay a kicker uh, in order to do it. So this is the only creature that just flat out enters the battlefield at this mana value. And it gives you the ability to, when you recast it, to squad it up a bunch of times. Yeah. Um, so you could cast it for four or six, eight, 10, 12, or whatever. So I thought that was actually just notable that white really doesn't have this on a creature ability so much. Uh, no, in the same way that white doesn't have cards that say enter the battlefield draw a card, except for recently. Now we've got that spirited companion and a couple of other ones too. Um, so I thought that was just notable. Just being able to like play, pay like six mana and take out like two really important threats. And then if you're in the flicker deck, you can just get this space marine devastator back over and over again. Absolutely. It could be really big. Yeah. Uh, and then the last card I thought was one of the best cards in the deck is Company Commander. This is two a white and a black for a 2-4 human soldier, and it has Command Section. Oh, that's kind of nice. It kind of sounds like what we're doing right now. Yeah. When Company Commander enters the battlefield... This is a section of the command zone. Yeah, yeah. This is the command section. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Duh. Okay, so when Company Commander enters the battlefield, create a number of 1-1 one, one white soldier creature tokens equal to the number of opponents you have. So this could be a 4-mana 2-4 that comes in with three 1-1s. One Pretty good. And then the second build is called Bring It Down. Whenever Company Commander attacks, creatures you control gain death touch until end of turn. Yeah, so those three 1-1s one become pretty serious threats yeah and this is just when it enters the battlefield not when it attacks so again a great flicker target um and you know cards that are similar to me that make three one ones when they come down uh elspeth pretty good sun's champion yep typically seen as one of those cards that are just just incredibly powerful and then the attacking thing is just gravy on top i think 
pretty cool. Very cool. Okay, so we have now covered the uh, best cards in the deck, the notable reprints, as well as who we'd run as commander. We're going to get to the juice and figure out what Jordan decided to add into this deck and what cards he decided to take out in our under $30 or around $30 experiment. But before we get to it, let's take a quick break and hear from our mid -roll sponsors. Look, Seven, autumn is finally here. So let's celebrate the season with fall's most craved flavor, pumpkin. Ren, no, please don't eat me. Oh, I won't, little pumpkin pal. Why eat you and I could have the pumpkin feast for two from Factor, the service that delivers fresh, never frozen meals ready to eat in just two minutes. Oh, hooray. With Factor, Seven and I can both eat our fill without having to shop, clean, or gouge out and cook your insides. Not my insides. Exactly. Factor is cheaper and faster than takeout. And with 30 plus meal choices each week, you can spice things up while staying on top of your food goals, thanks to options like vegan, keto, calorie smart, and protein plus. In fact, now that I've fueled up with Factor, I'm energized and ready for the Harvest Tide Festival. Please don't sacrifice me. No promises. Oh no! <laughs> Head to go.factor75.com slash command60 and use code command60 to get 60% off your first box. That's code command60 at go.factor75.com slash command60 to get 60% off your first box. Ambassador Blorpity Blorp Boop, we need you at the embassy. Finally, our negotiations with the Rum Dudley Flumbersons may yield a lasting peace. Thanks to the skilled team of economic and political officers, I hired on Indeed. With Indeed, I was able to attract, interview, and hire all in one place, making it the ideal ticket to find employees who will really stick, or as I like to call them, stickers. I found strong talent fast without breaking the embassy budget, thanks to tools like Instant Match, assessments, and of course, virtual interviews, which saved me days on hiring without any additional downloads, purchases, plugins, or goober students. Ambassador, the Heptapoots are attacking Blorp Prime! Then today, our people go to war. Indeed knows when you're growing your own business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why when you sponsor a job, you only pay for quality applications from resumes in our database matching your job description. Visit indeed.com slash command zone to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash command zone. Again, indeed.com slash command zone. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Now, a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. Well, well, well. Looks like you're in a bind, and only one card in your entire deck might save you. I, Demonic Tutor, <clears throat> am here to help you. In a game of magic, I can find whatever answer you need. Sadly, beyond the game, cardboard can't fix everything. That's where BetterHelp Online Therapy comes in. Speaking with a therapist can help you stop fixating on problems by teaching you to work towards solutions and become a better problem solver. For me, speaking with my therapist, Greg, helped me overcome my anxiety with public speaking. Now, I'm not just a private tutor. I'm an adjunct demonology professor at Seven Hells Technical College. Just fill out a brief survey and BetterHelp will search their deck of qualified therapists to find your perfect match. And you can switch at any time. It's convenient, entirely online, and affordable. It's certainly won't cost you your immortal soul like I do! <laughs> Wait, I just cost two mana? That seems broken. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash command zone today to get 10% off your first month. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. All right, we're back talking about the forces of the Imperium deck precon from Commander 40k. Uh, okay, so right out of the box, before we get into the cards that we're going to add and take out, Jordan, what did you think about this deck? Because you had to do some studying and look yeah. at it, right? I, I like the deck. I think there's a lot of like cool, powerful cards in it. Mm -hmm. Out of the box, it's unfocused. It it's got a lot of kind of expensive cards, and it's got a lot of cards that are sort of pushing, that are interesting toolbox pieces, but right. don't all really work together. Right. You it almost seems like you want to take the deck apart and put some pieces elsewhere and all that, right? So my, my goal in the upgrade was to just focus it more. I tried okay. to lower the curve, and then because we're switching to Marnius Kalgar instead of it being Inquisitor Greyfax, I just wanted to add more ways to make tokens consistently uh, while also just 
making the deck run a little smoother. Yeah, and, and of course, winning the game, which is really important. Yep. A lot of these sort of pre-cons don't have great win conditions on them, uh, so this is a way for us to help add in just that, right? A little bit of early action, a little bit of mid, and of course, some of those game enders. So let's start with the game enders. Uh, again, the, the exercise, we have around $30 for this exercise, mm -hmm. and we can only add 10 cards, and we can only take out 10, and typically we leave the mana base as is. We yep. don't want to mess with that. And Completely it's not, untouched. Not interesting either, right? I want to see the juice. What are the cool cards are putting in here and this first one is pretty cool so jordan let's talk about uh what i call a the the uh, the subject of these two first cards is a myriad of ways dot 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 yes well myriad the ability is obviously like pretty good with Marnius Kalgar because one, it's an aggressive thing that, you know, makes lots of tokens right. when you attack. And and if if people don't know, Myriad means that when a creature with Myriad attacks, it makes... For each opponent, other than defending opponent. playing, I'll read it. Yeah. You may create a token that's a copy of that creature that's tapping and attacking that player or a Planeswalker they control and then you exile those tokens at end of combat. So, those tokens enter the battlefield. If you have Marnius Kalgar out, you draw a card. You draw a card. Which is pretty cool. So, And you may get some extra Enter the Battlefield abilities, who knows, from absolutely. the myriad token copies. Yeah, there's a ton you can get out of it. Um, but the first card I added, which is an expensive one, is called Legion Loyalty. Is six white white yep. for an enchantment that just says creatures you control have myriad. All right. Every time a creature you attack, Every have creature. attacks, yeah, any of them, they're all going to make token copies for each other opponent tapped and attacking. Even your tokens will make tokens. Now, again, to be clear, for each creature that's attacking, it's only going to make one card draw from Marnius Kalgar for the right. two or more tokens that enter. But every single creature that attacks is going to have, have a separate instance of tokens entering the battlefield. So that means you're yes. going to draw for each of those individual creatures attacking for Marnius. Yeah. And because it's Legion loyalty, that just completely fits with Space Marine Legions. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, I wanted to keep the theme a little bit putting these things in. Yeah, I like that. All right, well, let's talk about your next edition here. Also a Myriad card. It's Blade of Selves. Next, yes, Blade of Selves. Blade of Selves used to be a much more expensive card. Yeah. It's been reprinted recently. And when I saw that it was like only a what? A couple bucks. Yeah, a couple bucks now. It just seemed like an auto include. And then I also realized, so one... It's gonna. You can just put it on one of your creatures and then attack, and that'll get you some nice aggressive stuff and card draw off of Marnius. It's just Kalgar. an equipment that says equipped creature has myriad, so but similar I, to Legion loyalty. Oh yes, we should explain what the card does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, but I also f realized kind of a cool interaction with Marnius Kalgar himself. Uh -huh. So if you put the Blade of Cells on Marnius Kalgar, right. and you attack normally. Yeah, those tokens will enter the battlefield, but because they're legendary, they'll all of, they'll all die. Right. But you can only have one Marnius Calgar on the battlefield at any time. But they will still ETB and see each other ETB. Oh. So if you equip Blade of Selves to Marnius Calgar and attack, you draw three cards. Right, because each of those tokens comes down and they all go, hey, more tokens came down. Yep. And they all have that ability on them. So mm -hmm. they will, the triggers will go on the stack, even though you have to just choose one of the Marniuses to stick around. Yep. So Very wow. cool. Yeah. I think attack, draw three cards seems pretty good to me. Yeah, that does seem very, very good. And uh, Marnius is a five mana commander. Blade of Selves costs two. Equip cost is four. So you'll be able to sort of curve this out, I think, and get the blade out first if you're able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so those are two myriad cards. Legion Loyalty is closer to $8, but they're actually both reprinted in Baldur's Gate. Uh, so that's, that's cool to see that these cards, you know, pretty relevant here. Yeah, very neat. All right, next up, repeatable creature tokens. There are some really interesting ads here. This first one, I think, has just always has always impressed me. It's it's just very good in a lot of decks. Yeah. Uh, and that's Felidar Retreat, which is three and a white for an enchantment, which has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, choose one. Create a 2-2 two, two white cat beast creature token or put a 1-1 one, one counter on each creature you control. These creatures gain vigilance until end of turn. Wow, they just had to gain vigilance as well. Um, now, obviously we're in Esper, so the land drops aren't as plenty as like a green deck, but this but you're still... you're still be hitting your land drops pretty often. Yeah, and especially with Marnius' ability, and now you're just making all your tokens get plus and plus and counters and get vigilance, or you just make a 2-2. Two -two. Yeah, so this does everything you want. It, yeah. it, if it's early in game and you're developing your board, it's drawing you cards, it's making tokens. Mm -hmm. If you already have a powerful board, it's just going to keep letting it grow and grow. I like that. And really help punch home. Yep. All right. Next up, we have Jadar Ghoul Caller of Nephalia uh, from mm, Crimson Vow or uh, Midnight Hunt. Midnight Hunt. It's Midnight Hunt. Yeah. One in the back for a 1-1 legendary creature human wizard. At the beginning of your end step, 
if you control no creatures with decayed, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token with decayed. And that token, decayed, all that means is it can't block, and when it attacks, you sack it at the end of combat. Which, honestly, is kind of a good thing, because that means you can attack with it, and then it's gone, and then you'll make a new one at the end of turn. Yeah, so no matter what, it's not like, oh, I'm swinging this 2-2, yeah, just let it through, it'll survive, it won't make another token. Yeah. No, it will die end of combat. So you're always forcing a little damage, which is really nice, mm -hmm. and then you're getting another one. And of course, drawing a card with Marnius Kalgar. Yep, uh, and just something that can make a token every turn to draw a card with Marnius Kalgar. It's good. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, ex especially this next one, I really love these types of cards in general. It seems like they've been getting a little more attention as well, because mana reduction, very powerful here. Yeah, so this next card is Oketra's Monument, which is uh, three mana for a legendary artifact. And it says, white creature spells you cast call, cost one less to cast. Okay. Um, there Including are, the commander, by the way. Yeah, there's a decent amount of white creatures in the deck, but the fact that it lowers the cost of the commander is, like, really important. Especially but, if you're playing this turn three, you can play Marnius on turn four. Exactly. Or you can play this on turn two. Okay, yeah, yeah. Which is huge, because you want Marnius out quick in yeah, this deck. Yeah, totally. Um, but its second ability says, whenever you cast a creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature token with vigilance. Wow. Not even a white creature spell, just a creature spell. Yeah, that's really nice. So in this deck, this is sort of like a, a cheap budget Guardian Project. Yeah, exactly. It's like Guardian Project. Uh, you have to have this and your commander out, um, but that seems really good. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's really solid, and I, I love Dominket, mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I always like putting those cards into things. Yeah, and it could be, too, that you're, because of the mana reduction, able to cast two creature spells, and then as a result, you get two card draws, and you just keep refueling it. So yeah, this seems like an all-around great package. Um, this next card may be the, like, best budget auto-include in the deck. Oh, in I like it a lot, too. In my opinion. It's, it's uh, I'll read it. It's Nadir Kraken. Let's get Kraken. One yeah. blue blue for a 2-3 Kraken. Whenever you draw a card, you may pay one. If you do, put a plus one, plus one counter on Nadir Kraken and create a 1-1 one, one blue tentacle creature token. So you can see the chain happening. I play a creature, I draw a card, and then I pay one, and then I make a 1-1, one, one, and I get a plus and plus on on the Deer Kraken, and then I draw a card again because the token came in the battlefield, and then I drew a card, so the Deer Kraken says, hey, do you want to pay one? And you can keep that going as long as you have the mana for it. So you could draw a lot of cards off this thing, right? You can turn all your, as long as you have a token into the battlefield, or you draw a card, which, you know, you do mm -hmm. at the beginning of every turn, you can turn all your mana into card draw wow. as long as you want. Yeah, and not just, it's not even colored mana, it's one of any color. Yep. Yeah, really good stuff. Nadir Kraken seems like a great card for this deck. I, I could see just kind of refilling your hand every turn with this thing. Now, do the Imperium mess with Kraken? Uh, so, they're... There's a couple things where they try and avoid what they call the Kraken, which okay. are like monsters out in the warp and maybe also, uh, yeah. you know, the Tyranids and stuff. So this isn't the best on flavor one. <laughs> maybe you could alter it if you really want to keep it on flavor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could right. be like, save us from the Kraken. There you go. Oh, Emperor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. This next one. Let's read it off, Jordan. This is Grim Hireling. This is three and a black. Great card. For a three, two creature, uh, Tiefling Rogue. And whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create two treasure tokens. And then it has the ability for black, sacrifice X treasures, target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn. Activate only as a sorcery. Yeah, you're never doing that. I've never seen that part of it happen. But no. Whenever but <laughs> one or more creatures deal combat damage, you make two treasure tokens. The Very good. I guess you've got a lot of tokens. You're happy to throw some away in combat. Not to mention your tokens that you're making with Marnius Kalgar have vigilance. Oh, so nice, yeah. You attack all the time. Right. Like, you want to be aggressive with this deck, and this is just going to help you make more mana. When and you don't play. forget, those tokens, when they enter, they are a token, and Marnius will see it and draw you a card. Yep, that's really good. Yeah, very good. Yeah, so this is the card advantage token section. The next card is Thorough Investigation, which is what you did, Jordan, in preparing this outline. Exactly. Uh, it's two in the white for an enchantment. Whenever you attack... Oh, whenever you attack, investigate. So you make a colorless clue artifact token. You can pay two to sack and draw a card. And then whenever you sacrifice a clue, venture into the dungeon. Hey. So you enter into the first room or keep hey, adventuring far. through. <laughs> Are there any dungeons in 40k? Uh, yeah. You dungeon like know? places? Look, yeah, sure. There's thousands well, and thousands way, of worlds out there. There's plenty <laughs> of dungeons. This budget upgrade guy was not for the theme of it. Jordan just tried to include where he could. I'm just giving him guff. Now, now, Thor Investigation, I actually did kind of include because of theme. Oh, really? Because the Inquisition is such an important oh, part. Oh, that's right. There is an Inquisitor is literally, okay. okay yeah. I like that. So I was like, oh, this one makes clues. It, it could be. That's a good like, point. Flavor it sort of like being like, we're going to root out the heretics and nice. the Xenos and, and all the enemies 
enemies of the Imperium. And, and occasionally venture into a Dungeons and Dragon dungeon. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look. And they're like, what strange universe is this? <laughs> there, there, there's a, just imagine you're, for those of you who know the lore, you're uh, venturing into a Space Hulk, which is like a, a oh, yeah, giant yeah, yeah. dead ship that you're searching around for stuff. Very cool, yeah. Dungeon. Yeah. And the Hulk's there, too. Mm-hmm. All right, next up, we have Court of Grace. I like this card a lot. This Two white whites favorites. for an enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you become the monarch. Hey! I guess the emperor is kind of like the monarch, I suppose. For the emperor! <laughs> yeah, you have to say that when you do it. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one white spirit creature token with flying. And if you're the monarch, create a 4-4 four, four white angel creature token with flying instead. So at the beginning of your upkeep, no matter what, you're going to make a 1-1. One, one. If Marnius is out, you draw a card. Yep. If you are able to hold on to the monarchy because you've got tokens with vigilance, you've got all sorts of scary creatures, then you make a 4-4 four, four instead and you get to draw a card. Yeah. Uh, I, I think this card is really good for this deck. Yeah. I mean, one, it's just constant uh, card draw from the token making. But also, I think it fits on theme two uh-huh. uh, because, you know, they have the Empire. They have their yeah, yeah. courts and stuff like that. This and, could be pre-fall of the Emperor as well because it's like a, a yeah. righteous sovereign makes for a blessed realm. And maybe that's where the humans were at before the Emperor yeah. got messed up in the when Civil War. When he was just the great emperor of mankind before he was the god emperor and yeah everything. yeah he's just uh, a very powerful dude and it also is going to make everyone at the table probably besiege you because you're going to be the monarch yeah but then it turns off someone goes for someone else with the monarch yeah but and i'll say this much is, no one is ever going to remove court of grace so if with your commander out this is yeah. basically kind of like a Rephrexian arena well the imperium of man is always beset on all sides by enemies and aliens and uh, heretics so i think that just creates that feel very nice and the last card we have here uh you want to read it jordan yes this is legion's landing uh this is one white for sorry just a single white for a legendary enchantment and when legion's landing enters the battlefield create a one one white vampire creature token with lifelink nice when you attack with three or more creatures transform legion's landing and it transforms into Adanto, the first fort, a legendary land, uh, which has tap to add white to your mana pool, or tap two and a white, pay two and a white and tap it and create a one one white vampire creature token with lifelink. Yep, so that makes a lot of sense. It's a token maker as just well as a regular land on the back, so it kind of yeah. ramps you. It's it's like a little bit of ramp. Yeah. It it's a very low drop that can make a token. Yeah, late then, in the game, if you just have Marnius out and you're like, all right, draw this. Well, at least I pay one white mana, I'll make a token, and I'll get a draw again. Yeah. I just think it seems like solid value and it's got another Legion thing in it. So it's yeah. on theme. Yeah. All right. So those were the cards you added. The total ended up being right over $30. So yeah. about $30 and 65 cents for the total. Uh, great job. I really like all of these additions. And Thanks. I think with Marnius, it'll really smooth the deck out. I, I think what I really wanted to do was every single card I added makes tokens in some way. Right. And it's just like, if you can just get to the point where when you play this deck, you are always making tokens it's just going to go smooth. Yep. I like that a lot. Now, of course, we always mention some honorable mentions. In this case, a couple of cards that were a bit out of the budget range, but if you happen to have them, you should definitely throw them in there if you can. The first is a card I really like. It's Adeline Resplendent Cathar. One white white for a star four legendary human knight with vigilance. Hey, that's on theme. Adeline's power is equal to the number of creatures you control. And then when you, whenever you attack, for each opponent, create a 1-1 one, one white human creature token that's tapped and attacking that player or a planeswalker they control. So Adeline does not herself need to attack. It could just be one of your yep. two Astarius white warrior creature tokens, mm-hmm. right? They can all pop in and they'll instantly create three 1-1s one, tapped and attacking. Who cares if they survive or not? You're going to draw some cards. Very powerful, card. very effective. Would work very well in the deck. Yeah. I really wanted to fit it in, which is also true for this next one. Both of these are ones I like tried to fit into the budget. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're just too They kind of take now. over the whole budget. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This next one is Battle Angels of Tear, which is two white white for a four four creature angel knight uh, with flying and myriad. So right away it you know already has that myriad, which means that it will create tokens when you attack with it. And then it has whenever Battle Angels of Tear deals combat damage to a player, draw a card if that player has more cards in hand than each other player. Then you create a treasure token if that player controls more land than each other player. Then you gain three life if that player has more life than each other player. Right. So only one player can be any of these things. 
uh, for all, all three of them. And when you're swinging with battle angels, you're presumably making three more. So that's four of them. And you're, you're, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, two, two more. more. Yeah. So that's three of them. And if you're hitting all your opponents, so if any of them has more life, you gain life. If any of them has more tr- uh, more lands than everyone else, you make treasures. Uh, so and if you dr- and then you draw cards if someone has more cards than yeah. Everyone. So as long as you're down on any of those three categories, then a battle angel hit will get you something. If you happen to hit on the first two of those categories, then each time, then battle angels of tier attacking will net you three cards. Wow. Because you would make a treasure token, which would draw you a card off of oh, Marnius. Right. The myriad tokens would draw you a card off of Marnius. And then them hitting someone, hitting draw someone, drawing four card. cards. No, that's just three. Oh, okay. 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 But it's a lot. <laughs> that is, yeah, it is quite a lot. Yeah. All right. Well, now to make room for all these cards, we got to cut some as well. And so we went through the deck and we found 10 cards that we thought needed to be exterminatist. Mm-hmm. Um, and Which, uh, spoiler, uh, we'll is, see how it goes. Is, yeah, we'll, we'll see get there. one of those cards. All right. So the first card that we recommend taking out, but maybe just building a deck around instead is Nyam Shai Mirad. Have you ever heard of this character? Uh, I, I do not know this character in particular. I think that they're it's a, a cool rogue trader or something. They are a rogue trader. That's the name of its ability. So oh, two yeah. white and a black for a 3-3 three, three legendary human rogue with rogue trader. Whenever Nyam Shai Murad deals combat damage to a player, you may have that player return target permanent card from their graveyard to their hand. If you do, that player chooses a permanent card in your graveyard, then you put it onto the battlefield under your control. So it's interesting. You're you're allowing someone else to bring a permanent card back to their hand, and if they do it, then they get to choose a card that's a permanent in your uh, graveyard and put this onto the battlefield. Yep. Really cool idea. It's got a lot of politicking involved. I think you really want to be able to control your graveyards, but this is not what this deck with Marnius Calgar is trying to do, right? Yeah, I, I think it seems like a cool card. And to be entirely clear, not all these cards are cut because I think that they're bad cards or right. anything. It's just we wanted it to fit more... On the theme of working in Marnius Calgar. Yeah, if you are if you play the Marnius Calgar list that Jordan's designed and play Nyam Shai Murad, it's not going to do what you want it to yeah. do. It's going to be like, a, oh, maybe this will work. And, you know, that's why I say maybe you can take this out and build it somewhere else. I think it'd make a cool commander. Yeah, oh, I think so too. So the but, next card, and this pained me to my core to cut from the deck, Yeah, uh, is Exterminatus. Uh, Exterminatus is five white black. Uh, for a sorcery, non-land permanents your opponents control lose indestructible until end of turn. Destroy all non-land permanents. Ooh, so this is a really big board wipe. Very all powerful non-land board land permanents here. Well, and in 40k, Exterminatus is what they use, is what the Imperium uses when things have gone really bad. It's <laughs> basically like wipe a planet out. Yeah, it seems like it. It's destroying all non-land permanents and making anything lose indestructible. So, um, yeah, this this is pretty nuts, but it kind of destroys everything you're building as well, right? Well, that's that's the problem. I mean, we talked about the deck has five board wipes in it. Yeah. And you probably want to be the deck with the most creatures on board. So I just don't think you want to run that many. And one that costs seven, Yeah, it's just it's just a lot. I agree. Sorry, Exterminatus. All right, next up, we are taking out Grey Knight Paragon. Four and a white for a 4-4 Stardust Knight with Flash. And when it enters the battlefield, destroy target attacking creature. If that creature is a demon, exile it instead. So, white's the color of Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile. This is a five-mana Flash creature that destroys an attacking creature when it gets flashed in. It's just too narrow. If no one attacks, then what do you do? Yeah, and, and I mean... Think about, like, most of the stuff you want to remove yeah. in Commander. Yeah, sometimes someone's got some crazy big attacking creature you want to get rid of. But a lot of times you just want to kill their Esper Sentinel. Yeah, and you would much rather do it with a spell that costs one mana, not five as yeah. well. It, yeah, they're not attacking with their Esper Sentinel. They're not attacking with their Seedborn Muse. All these cards you actually want to get rid of, Granite Paragon is not going to do that. So and five mana. holding up five mana is just a lot. Yeah, and, and the deck, by the way, is not the kind of deck that you want to hold up five mana with. There's not, like, the Mystic Confluences sitting in here and yeah. all that. No, you're a, you're a, you're a pay it forwards, get your tokens on the board, and swing. The one thing that does make it a little better for holding up mana than just any general thing is yeah. at least you have the six mana ability on Marnius Calgar. So right, if you're holding right. up six mana, you could be like, well, I could just be, you know, waiting to do the tokens later. Yeah. But it's still just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, it would be an underwhelming play. I agree there. The next card that I decided to take out was Redemptor Dreadnought. This is five for an artifact creature, Astartes Dreadnought. It is a four, four. And it has Fallen Warrior as an additional cost to cast the spell. You may exile a creature card from your graveyard. It is Trample. And then it has the ability Plasma Incinerator. Whenever Redemptor Dreadnought attacks, if a card is exiled with it, it gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the power of the exiled card. 
So, oh boy, this is a five mana four four. If you don't have any creatures in your graveyard, and yeah. if you do, you have to wait until it attacks to give it plus X plus X. It's only until end of turn, and it's specifically the power of the exiled card. Yeah, it, it's not a good blocker. It also just like, I mean, what if all you have to get rid of from your graveyard is a two two? Yeah. Like, cool. I paid <laughs> yeah. five mana for a six six trampler. Fine. Yeah, it's not as good as Colossal Dreadma, everybody. No. Okay, so we'll cut that one. Next up is a Reaver Titan and seven mana, and big reason you cut it. Yeah. Uh, artifact vehicle that's a 10 10, and it's got three abilities. The first one is uh, Void Shield, so it has protection from mana value three or less. So, you know, Generous Gift, all those sort of one random removal spells. To and it's, it's hard to chump block. Hard to chump block, that's right. Uh, and then it has the second ability, Gatling Blaster. Whenever Reaver Titan attacks, it deals five damage to each opponent. Mm -hmm. And then it crew costs is uh, four as its last ability. So you need four power of creature to tap to turn this into a, a, a actual moving thing um it's a 10 10 for seven mana that by itself is like cool but vehicles are just not that great still i mean if you can attack a couple times with this you're gonna do a lot of damage but this is a seven mana spell it doesn't have haste it's gotta be crew four I yeah think by itself so on an empty board it's hoops. yeah very too many hoops yeah um but maybe in the in the in the sort of the the vehicle deck that can easily crew things and cheat some stuff out it could be fun but not this one we're looking to make tokens not vehicles next up i took out a sister hospitaler uh this is four white black for a three two creature human cleric and it has medicus ministorum uh, when Sister Hospitaller enters the battlefield, return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. You gain life equal to its mana value. Okay, so it's a six mana reanimate type spell, but you're gaining the life instead of losing it. Uh, it's on a creature. It doesn't have flash. It's good in maybe a reanimator deck. Yeah, it's it's a powerful effect. Uh, it's expensive, though, and it's... I just don't see this deck having the targets to make it worth paying the six mana to get one thing back and gain yeah. a bit of life. What I want to see is a deck that gets us into the graveyard, you reanimate this, and then yes. you use it to bring back something even scarier, right? Like you're doubling up on the, the, the Enter the Battlefield ability. But Yeah, exactly. This is a token deck. When those tokens die, they don't go to the graveyard. They can't be reanimated. So it doesn't actually work with the deck, even though I think this card is actually really sweet. Yeah, I think there's definitely a place where this card has a home. I just don't think it's this budget upgrade guy. Yeah, and I don't think you <laughs> feel great if you have to pay six six mana for sister hospitaler because there's again a lot of abilities that do this for five mana and unburial rights and all sorts of stuff like that mm -hmm. okay deployed to the front is the next card we've cut it's five white white for a sorcery there's a common theme by the way the cards we've cut so far are four mana five mana seven mana six mana and five mana yep. and this one's seven to sorcery it says create x one one white soldier creature tokens where x is the number of creatures on the battlefield this is again a very win more card that if there's nothing on the battlefield, like when you cast a vehicle, you're just, you 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 hate it. <laughs> you're not happy, right? This is the only card I cut that does make tokens. And I, I just don't really see, I, I feel like there's a ton of situations where this card just doesn't do it for you. Like yeah. if you already have a really powerful board, and so you're getting a bunch because you have like, you know, 10, 15 creatures. You're already board, winning. You're good. You don't need 15 more one ones. I mean, maybe it could turn almost winning into like a full winning thing. Yeah. But in a lot more situations, like you've just been board wiped or uh, it doesn't do anything. It does nothing if the board's yeah. just been wiped. Or just two players are not on creature-based strategies. Yeah. Yep. Or, or even like, let's say everyone else does have a ton of creatures yeah. and you make 10 one ones off of that. You're basically just buying, they're just chump blockers. Yeah, especially the by the time you're casting a seven drop, they may not do what you want to do. And Calgar would only draw you one card off of this. So. Yeah. So it's a cool, big, flashy effect, but it's not going to get you sort of where you want. It doesn't scale well, I think. Yeah. Um, next up was the Triumph of St. Catherine. This is four and a white for a 5-5 five, five creature human warrior with lifelink and uh, pre Presidium Protectiva. <laughs> When Triumph of St. Catherine dies, exile it and the top six cards of your library in a face-down pile. If you do, shuffle that pile and put it back on top of your library. And then it has Miracle for one and a white. Okay, so this says, I'm dying, but not really. I'm going to get into the top six. Maybe if you draw me next turn or whatever turn you do, you can Miracle me for one and a white. And if you have some top deck manipulation, this could be really cool. Yeah, you, you could like, almost always get it to the top the next turn, right? This deck doesn't really have this. And, and it also... so. Miracle is a really cool, flavorful ability for the Sisters of Battle, which is like kind of part of. But 
especially if this deck is running like it's supposed to, you're going to be drawing a ton of cards. Yeah, you're going to draw your turn. triumph again. The chance that this is your first card each turn seems pretty low. Yeah. Second uh, and third, the, the percentages just go higher and higher. Yeah, and if it's just a ma five mana, five, five lifelink that comes back, I don't want to be drawing that over and over again. Yeah, and notably, Miracle is the first card you draw each turn. Yep. Uh, and if this deck is channeling through it, again, you're not going to you're not going to be very happy mm -hmm. about that. Okay, next up we have For the Emperor! For the Emperor! Three and a white sorcery. Creatures you control gain plus two, plus two, and gain vigilance and lifelink until end of turn. So this is just your run-of-the-mill... Get them big, get them hard, and pop in with a uh, sorcery. It's not even really an overrun or anything, though. Nope. Because it, it doesn't give trample. It's just vigilance and lifelink. Vigilance, lifelink, and the tokens you make with Marnius Kalgar already have vigilance. Yeah. Um, so it, I just feel like what basically turns into a big life gain spell... Yeah, it just doesn't feel worth yeah, it. Yeah, maybe you can knock someone out with it, but again, these sort of like one-time effects are not that great in Commander. We've seen it over and over again. If you have a way to repeat it, or a card that's so big and powerful like Crater of Behemoth that it kills everyone, then great. But it feels like for the Emperor, it would have a really hard time actually taking out players because it doesn't have Trample. And there are more and better ways in the deck to do effects like that. Yeah, totally. Uh, the Including, final card, by the way, uh, Felidar Retreat, which we already talked about. Yeah. It's much better than For the Emperor. Felidar Retreat is, is amazing, yeah. Yeah. Um, the last card I decided to cut was Knight Paladin. Uh, this is five for a 6-6 six, six artifact vehicle. I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much enough. Uh, but it has Trample, and then it has Rapid Fire Battle Cannon. When Knight Paladin enters the battlefield, it deals four damage to each opponent. And then it has Crew only one, which okay. makes it pretty crewable. But... Uh, yeah. It's a lot like the... Uh, the other one, Reaver Titan? Yeah, it's a lot like the Reaver Titan, which kind of makes sense because knights are sort of like smaller titans uh, okay. in the lore for stuff. But it, it's just too low impact. It enters, yeah. it does some damage. Maybe Look, if you had... If you can flicker this, sure. if you a ghostly flicker, and that's the deck, and you want to just get this into the battlefield five times, because whenever it enters the battlefield, deals four damage to each opponent, that, that can be a big game. Yeah. But this deck isn't doing that. No, not and, at all. Yeah, crewing, not making tokens... It seems like all the cards we cut, you could almost just instantly put into another deck. Sure, kind of yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's or your, those are your 10 cuts, Jordan. Let's talk a little bit about how the deck plays. Uh, the first thing you wrote down here is that Kalgar is a 5-drop, right? It's 2 yep. in Esper, so let's talk about that real quick. So you really want to get Kalgar out as fast as you can. Yep. Um, the whole deck just gets way, way better as soon as Kalgar is out, which is why it's nice to add in you know a little bit of the extra ramp and the stuff. But once he's out... Like, uh, the deck just really, really starts humming. Mm -hmm. The card advantage that he creates is just ins absurdly explosive. Like, yeah. every time I've goldfished and gone through it, uh, you just end up with so many cards that you're like, oh, I have to pick which one of these to discard. Yeah, yeah, Which yeah. I know some people hate, but is a good position to be in. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh-huh. So I think, ideally, you want to try and get a token producer out before you play Kalgar so that you can immediately start getting value off of him. Yep, like Nadar would be a great card here. Yeah, it would be really huge. Uh, but he's definitely worth playing ASAP. Yeah. Because he turns the deck on, and there's so many cards that just get better when he's out there. If you can get him to stick, building a board that like goes very wide and drawing a huge number of cards, it's just very easy. Yeah. Yeah, it, it just happens really quick. Because, I mean, he kind of enables that himself with his six-mana thing, which is like your backup plan yeah, if yeah, everything yeah. goes wrong. Um, okay. Very cool. Then it's just kind of a matter of protecting him and staying aggressive so that you can, you know, dig some of the for some of those go-wide payoffs and... Uh, Bring it home for the Emperor. Conquer everything for the Emperor. You yeah, know? Uh, we took the card conquer for the, the Emperor galaxy. out, but you can still save for the Emperor during the game and be very thematic. And you should. You should, yeah. The Forces Imperium are... They're counting on you, too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, to the listeners, let us know what you think about the Forces of the Imperium 40k deck, as well as any of the other decks that we've talked about so far and, and done these budget upgrade guides for. These are some of my favorite videos. Let us know if any of the new cards we talked about today are going to slot perfectly into another commander deck, or if you would run Marnius Calgar yourself in a, a card that we maybe missed, and there's a great budget include that could also fit within that uh, $30 limit. Uh, let us know in the comments and all that good stuff. And look, if you're just looking to buy those cards and to pick them up right now and upgrade this deck for yourself, or you heard about the Knight Paladin, and you're like, you know what? That would be great in my uh, Flickr, Aminatu, whatever. Whatever yeah. it is, check out cardkingdom.com slash command. That's right, Card Kingdom is back.
back, baby, and they are sponsoring our content. And you can help us out by using that affiliate link, cardcame.com slash command. You can buy all the magic cards you need. In one fell swoop, you can copy paste deck lists. You can do so much great stuff. Not to mention they got top notch quality service, uh, customer quality service. If you're ever in the Seattle area, they've got some of the best game stores in the world. Mox Boarding House, incredible, beautiful location. But really, just check out their website, cardkingcom slash command, and you can help support our content by using that affiliate link. And then when you get those cards, put them into an Ultra Pro sleeve. Maybe you want the sleeves that have Inquisitor Grayfax on the back. Maybe you want a play mat with some cool secret lair art you can't find anywhere else. Well, ultrapro.com slash command has all that on their store, and they're always running great deals. So check it out, protect your stuff, and get the stuff you need and great quality at a great price. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to get you some amazing deals and help you grow that collection the way you want to. Yep. All right, end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. There's lots of things to talk about, Jordan. Um, you watching any new shows recently? What, well, what do you want to talk about? I have, been watching, uh, I have been watching some new shows, but I was thinking that because this is a Warhammer 40K ah, yeah, thing, good call. I would talk about some stuff that I've been really into recently outside of just like the lore and stuff. Yeah, I've been it, really it. into like the hobby side of things. I'm building my army, which is an Adeptus Mechanicus army. Okay. We're like part of the Imperium. They run the guns and stuff. But uh, painting is really, really cool. And there's just an amazing... Uh, community around like painting miniatures, painting Warhammer stuff. Right. Specifically, a channel I've been watching a ton of and really, really enjoying is one called Squidmar Minis. Ooh. Uh, and he is a, it is a two really solid painters who just do some awesome painting challenges and stuff like that. They've recently been doing this thing where uh, he started out with one mini and has through like Facebook groups been trading it for larger minis Whoa. and then traded the larger mini for It's a like that squad. thing where you start with a dollar and see if you can turn it into a hundred, right? Exactly. <laughs> and and his goal is to get to the perfect full army that Henry Cavill likes to play. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, because Henry Cavill's a big Warhammer fan. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So he's, he's, got, he's done a good job building it so far? Yeah, it, it's really cool. I've loved watching the like journey of the trades. And sometimes he's he's like painted up and improved the minis to, to a little bit. To get a bit. better trade for it, yeah. But besides that, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that's like about the technique, how to be better at painting. Very cool. Um, but even if you don't do any painting yourself, it's just extremely entertaining to watch. Very cool. Yeah, it's like those uh, clock repair videos or the ones where they take old equipment and repair it and just it's slow and it's methodical, but you get to watch expertise yeah. and, and the craftsmen at work. And these guys are great. They have great personality and they just do fun, neat ideas. Like another one of my favorite ones they did, they took glasses that made it so... They took glasses that made it so you actually couldn't see the color of what you were painting <laughs> and had a palette of random colors and had to just like guess. Guess, yeah, yeah, how yeah. How they yeah. were painting it. That's And when cool. they revealed it, it's like, oh. Ooh, this <laughs> or, looks awful. Or nice. sometimes it was great. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, painting is one of the most, uh, it's also really therapeutic if you've ever done it. Um, really it's, great. It's really, really a big part of the Warhammer scene. If you're into it, you can check it out. If you just want to watch the videos, I've seen myself just sometimes putting them on the background as well. Mm -hmm. So what is the channel called again? Squidmar Minis. All right, if you're over on the Squidmar Minis, let them know that Jordan from the Command Zone sent you and that he gave y'all a shout out. Uh, and if you're here watching from Squidmar Minis, thanks so much for entertaining us with your great content. All right, cool. Let's move to the cleanup step and give a big thanks to our team here at the Command Zone. We've got Damon Lenz, Ashlyn Rose, Arthur Mellicroft, Craig Blanchett, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Garav Galati, Jamie Block, Evan Lindberger, Mitch Trafford, and... Josh Lee Kwai. Hey. And big thanks as always to Truck Tie who helps out with the statistics and all the nitty gritty math so that we can present this data to you and help you become more informed players. Uh, thanks, Truck. And big shout out as always to Jeffrey Palmer. He occasionally does the living card animations behind us, but the, his animations of Soul Ring and stuff do start our show at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast. You can find Jeffrey doing really cool photoshops of Paddington Bear oh, into yeah. magic cards every day at Living Cards MTG on Twitter. All right, Jordan, I think we have to just end this uh, podcast episode with one salute to our emperor. So should we say it together? Yeah, let's do it. <gasps> For the emperor! Thank you. For your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>